Toronto and enjoyed all the previous visits I made here and heard wonderful things about the street. So I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I'll just say a few uh, bureaucratic things first. There are some handouts which I, I would be glad to have each of you here take. They consist of a syllabus, uh, a sheet of provocation for today, and a blank sheet. Uh, my assistant, uh, Lucia, will come now. Uh, and a blank sheet on which I'd appreciate your uh, letting me know the following things, because uh, I, so I will be talking to an audience that I have some idea of and um, uh, will be responsive accordingly. Uh, so let me know what your name is, um, your local address and telephone number, uh, your official status if you have one uh, at the university, uh, your status in the course, in other words, if you're taking it for uh, credit uh, or uh, auditing it, so that this paper, I'd really appreciate everyone, even uh, unless you're just absolutely passing by uh, for the moment, uh, to fill out. Uh, but then, of course, just tell me what your uh, background is in critical theory and, and philosophies uh, as of the sort that I'll be talking about is relevant to the course. Also, what your general interests are you know, in the study of literature or philosophy, and then what your particular interests are in relation to the topics of this course, all of which could take, you know, three sentences. I mean, I'm not looking for an essay, but just to get some sort of uh, fix on the class so that when I make the assignments and also make selections from among the various uh, ways that we could go and additional readings that I would be putting on uh, the reading list, um, I'll be uh, addressing you. Um, today, as um, mostly uh, during these lectures, the way in which I'll work it is I'll come in and I'll make a, a, a presentation uh, for about an hour, but an interruptible presentation. Uh, sometimes you'll, you'll want to ask questions while I'm talking, and I may say, hold off on that because I'm about to get to it or that's something later. But for, for the most part, it's interruptible. Then we'll have a short break uh, for about five minutes and then come back for general discussion. Um, I can't say uh, emphatically enough how much the course will depend upon the dynamics of the course and the dynamicness of the course will depend upon your asking uh, questions making comments, uh, raising objections. Uh, I, I respond to that. Uh, I can talk endlessly in response to a question that's asked, but I will always make some sort of initial presentation and also set up each week um, an advance notice of what it is that I'll be concentrating on for the next week. The outline that you have gives you a pretty good idea, and that will be roughly uh, the order in which I'll be um, both assigning texts and discussing them. And, um, but I, uh, depending upon the interest that you have in certain topics, and also as your, as it may turn out, the interests of the group as a whole pile up, I might uh, decide to linger on one thing rather than another and skip over something else. Um, uh, the course is not the delivery of a body of information, and although we'll be reading some texts very closely, the course is really not close textual examination. Uh, it's rather the exploration of a set of issues. And they will operate as issues only insofar as they are issues for you. To the extent that we're all going to find ourselves in agreement on something, we'll move on until we hit conflict, until we hit difference, and that will be where it becomes interesting. Um, the assumption is that you're coming in with difference. The assumption is going to be also that you're going to exit with difference. But I think something will happen along the way. Uh, don't see this as precisely a conversion to or corruption to relativism, but rather perhaps a form of modification, transformation, at least effect uh, in a direction uh, that I will be outlining. Uh, let me begin, while you're sort of looking at all this, by putting a few terms on the blackboard. If I, um, I keep wondering about what this umbilical cord is going to do to me. I haven't had one in a long time. Um, Okay. Okay, well, that's, uh, you m might have noticed that was part of the title of the course. Um, the way in which I'm going to be using uh, the term axiology, you could think of it this way. Axiology is to value and value judgment what hermeneutics is to meaning and interpretation. In a very broad sense, 
axiology could be thought of as simply as any general theory of uh, query about set of questions raised uh, about value, and it has that uh, meaning uh, in uh, in philosophy. But it also can be seen, just as hermeneutics could be thought of as just a general investigation of problems of meaning and interpretation. Um, but it also, like hermeneutics, has come to mean the specific project of trying to ground uh, proper uh, conception of meaning and correct interpretation in the case of <coughs> hermeneutics, and the same thing in relation to a value and judgment. Uh, to arrive at a proper notion of value and to arrive at grounds or procedures or algorithms or some way of thinking about judgment so that you get the right one. Um, and of course it is just that notion of axiology, that second notion of axiology that I will be questioning here. Uh, and if certain work in post-structuralism is sometimes characterized as anti-hermeneutics, that is hermeneutics which is against the project of foundational hermeneutics, this could also be seen as, I usually call it post-axiology, that is a continued investigation of questions of value and judgment, but without the presumption that there is going to be a determinate uh, value and a determinate set of procedures for finding out the correct judgment of something. Um, second word that turns up a lot, and you, know, you don't need to have it explained to you, but I'll, I want to talk about it, which is privilege. Uh, because sometimes, uh, you know, I will say, well, this is this privileged meaning, this is the privileged term in this dualism, this is a privileged um, a text, uh, all right. Now, the objection to privilege is not to selection. Selection is going to be something that, as we will see, we do continuously. That's part of my, uh, my story, is that evaluation, selection, choice, um, placing of things in, if you like, hierarchies or at least in arrays of preference is simply part of uh, any responsive organisms or at least a human beings' continuous activity. So it's not privileging that's objected to as opposed to what? Uh, not caring as opposed to thinking that everything is the same as everything else. That's certainly not what I would be proposing. When one suggests that privileging is something that you want to question, it is the selection that denies that it's a selection. It is the preference that denies that it is a preference and the act of an agent. It is the making of, giving of priority to something or assigning of superiority to something with the assumption or within a set of, um, within a discourse that suggests that it's inevitable, that it's necessary, that it's intrinsic, that it's obvious, that it's natural, that it can be taken for granted, that it's not questionable. So it is that aspect of privileging uh, that becomes uh, of interest and, and to be uh, questioned. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to use the word nominalism. Uh, um, in a certain uh, restricted and perhaps not altogether kosher way uh, to talk about a, an attitude that I will take about terms that come up. In effect, all the key terms, every one of the key terms, including words like of and the, the being an extremely important word in connection with value, because the value of is already saying a great deal, namely that it's unitary, and also of, namely that it's possessed by something, so that even small words can be, everything is up for grabs, everything is questionable. But in relation to the key terms, art, value, reality, uh, judgment, um, uh, truth, reason, standards, these being the terms that we'll be talking about. What I want to say about all of them when we ask the question, well, what is reality? Well, what is truth? Well, what is value? My answer is always going to be in the first instance, second instance, and last instance. It's a term with a history of variable, multiple, and still changing usage. That's what it is, okay? There are other things that could be asked about what you know, about these terms, like what is the essential nature of X? Well, I, it's hard for me to grab hold of what that means, that question. Uh, you can puzzle it, you can worry it, you can talk about it, but I think I'm going to find myself always going back to what were the conditions in which that articulation uh, got produced. Uh, so in other words, we will understand terms themselves as contingent, so that's no surprise. Uh, of course, we can stipulate senses, we can stipulate meanings, we can say in this discourse we're going to be using, and I will be uh, suggesting this about some key terms like value and economy. Uh, nevertheless, 
recognizing that this is a usage which is being introduced under particular conditions, which will have a take or an uptake, depending upon uh, how it works and its extensibility itself, that is, how expandable it will be, will itself be contingent. Uh, so this is not to say that we can't investigate terms and assign senses, but it means that um, it won't be taken for granted. Um, when the sense of a term, such as art, reality, reason, standards, and so forth, is investigated as part of a history of usage, it is not merely the term in isolation, but the term as it is embedded in a whole set of other ideas, or what I tend to call conceptual syntax. That is, it's that term, and the terms that surround it, and the roots and path passages that go from one set of terms and observations about it to another, so that you have a cluster of the sort that we have uh, become used to calling discourse. Um, but I'm calling it conceptual syntax in particular relation to these fairly abstract uh, terms. Um, I also want, that was nominalism. Uh, I also want to talk a bit about begging the question. It's been, because begging the question is one of the most recurrent and definitive moves of axiologic logic and of all arguments uh, in this um, arena of debate. Uh, I think it's very important to emphasize that begging the question is not just a form of philosophical, you know, failure of etiquette, all right? That when you have begged the question, what you have done is you have taken for granted that which is at issue. Therefore, what has come out of your mouth is nothing. Anything that begs the question, any statement in an argument that begs the question has canceled itself out because it is not added anything, it has not contributed anything, it has already assumed that which is at issue. Uh, assuming what's at issue, okay, taking it for granted as inevitable, uh, is characteristic in the arguments that one gets um, that relate to self, the supposed self-refutation of relativism and many of the other charges that I'll talk about in connection with what is called relativism and which could be defined in the first, I have two definitions of relativism. The first, which is, uh, which I hope to make all of you, hope to make all of you relativists, at least in this first sense, and that is people who question uh, the assumptions uh, of traditional axiology. So the minute you've questioned something, the minute you said, well, maybe, I mean, I want to ask a few words about, like, objective, aha, we have a relativist in our midst. All right, so the, the first thing is simply that the questioning itself becomes, without any assertion, without any attitude, without any position, without any alternate formulation having been offered, is already called relativism. And as, as such, uh, I would hope that we would inevitably be relativists. The second, which is a whole list of supposed positions, dispositions, failures, catastrophes uh, that go along with it, that's what I will question as uh, perhaps not necessarily following and indeed not following at all. It seems to follow, and this is what I will suggest, through the typical inversion of the classic uh, view of itself. So if you do not believe my absolutism, then you are guilty of my conception of relativism. If you do not believe my objectivism, then you must be guilty of my conception of subjectivism. This is a kind of begging the question. Among the questions that are begged among the issues is whether those dualisms are the only possibilities, whether there aren't alternative formulations for some of these uh, classical oppositions. Um, OK, uh, I'll say, uh, I'll be talking about it endlessly, but just so that I have an initial take on it. By contingent, uh, they say a lot of things about the word and will be saying a, a lot about it in, in the book, which will be sort of, I, my suggestion is take a look at the book, sort of see what my line is, read the first three chapters, because they're going to be relevant for the first, um, well, the first three chapters I'd say right away, that will give you a sort of a menu. Uh, the fourth chapter is relevant to reading Hume and Kant, and then I will, you know, on the syllabus, assign which chapters to sort of look at again as we're looking at particular questions that are related to uh, sort of key to the scriptures uh, in, in contingencies of value. The course is not going to be uh, a repetition of the book, but the statements that I made there are going to be ones that I'll refer to, and sometimes amplifying them is a, as good a structure as any. 
for bringing some of those issues out. Uh, but particularly, you probably want to look at the last chapter because the last chapter basically consists of all the questions that I have received about the various alternative formulations that I've offered over the past 10 or 15 years from various audiences, students, colleagues, uh, and others. And they may be uh, a number of them the questions that you'd want to ask. So, um, you know, do I refute myself? Uh, will the world fall to pieces? Is, Ed, is it true that anything goes? Am I incapable of political action? Uh, you know, th these may be the things that occur to you. So at least I have a word or two to say about them. Those words themselves may not be, um, or may not necessarily put to an end your questioning, but at least it will give you some, some line uh, uh, to, to follow. Anyway, what I'll be... Uh, the simplest way to think of and uh, of contingent in the sense that I'm using it is conditional. Uh, it, it, contingent in the sense of conditional as opposed to autonomous. Uh, conditional meaning dependent on other things. I usually say variables meaning dependent on things that themselves vary. All right, that's what it means. Uh, I also say emergent. By emergent, what I mean is that there are conditions that vary and that are not altogether predictable. Uh, and that, that combination puts us in a certain uh, relationship to all phenomena that are contingent. And the question will then be, which ones aren't? And I'm not sure that there are any that aren't, though there may be certain conditions that are very stable uh, and that change very slowly and that are very widespread. Uh, so this already introduces a kind of structure that uh, I'm going to re return to over and over again, which is more or less uh, actually the alternative for the course that I would have preferred would have been more or less relativism. Uh, more or less, uh, it's a good thing to start operating with more, the more or less, meaning that for many uh, classic binaries, for many classic oppositions, uh, it can be seen that in asserting, in raising a question, you are not necessarily asserting the opposite, but you are observing that there is a continuum and that that which is seen as the opposite is, you know, one point. Uh, so it is not that, uh, well, there is this which is objective, there is this which is universal, all right? It could be there is this which is so widespread as to not create any uh, questions. Uh, there is this which is uh, changes so little uh, as to have no effect uh, in time, all right? Uh, that's a better way of thinking because it allows you to move bit by bit, degree by degree around, and it doesn't create the necessity for a different principle of explanation in connection with the so-called objective and the so-called unchanging, eternal, and universal. It allows it to be seen as part of the same general type of explanation that you're giving for what would be more obviously seen as the contingent, that is, the more rapidly changing, the more obviously sub, uh, sub subjective, if you like, the more obviously historical, if you want to use that term. Um, okay, so if contingent uh, suggests conditional, dependent on emergent, variable circumstances, it would then be opposed to, seen in opposition to, seen as questioning notions of those phenomena, those concepts, value, for example, as intrinsic, as autonomous, as unconditioned, which is to say as necessary, and as necessary in accord with the usual forms of necessity, that is nature, logic, fact, experience. Uh, as um, being the grounds of that which is seen as non-contingent. As I say, it will always be a question for me whether there is anything that is non-contingent, or at least anything that we can name, anything that we can think about and predicate. Um, another word that will occur, and here I do want to give a very specific uh, definition and say that when I use the word economy, I will always be using it, except when I'm saying otherwise, uh, in, in the sense of a system of apportionment and circulation of goods of any kind has to be added. So goods of any kind, and that means any kind, you know, moral, intellectual, aesthetic, material, immaterial, unnameable, uh, uh, long-lasting, <laughs> and uh, ephemeral of any kind. So that's what I will mean by an economy. And so when I say that uh, value uh, is neither intrinsic 
uh, to an object, nor the projection of a subject, but the product of the dynamics of an economy. Okay, it's the word economy in that sense, rather than in one of its senses, which is political economy or market economy, uh, which is one of the, one of the systems of apportionment and circulation of goods. Um, but I want to use the term uh, always in this in this very broad sense, or it's and possibly narrowable. Uh, and then, of course, the word good and goods, uh, which we can meditate about a great deal, but which I'll, I will just, just put this out for the moment, because I'll be talking a little bit more in a few minutes about the scope of the course, so I want you to hear how I'll be using these terms as I trot them by. Uh, good seems to operate in our discourse of value, and here I'm making a historical observation rather than uh, making a stipulated definition, seems to operate in the discourse of value as an irreducible positivity. That is, you can't get any further. Even those who try to get further by reversing it, um, such as Bataille, and that's a, a figure who I deal with and will uh, deal with a little bit uh, uh, more later in the term, uh, who tries to make, um, in effect, loss the good. Nevertheless, in making loss the good, reestablishes the good as the irreducible positivity. So it seems to be that we are locked, that we cannot get out of a vocabulary if we're going to be talking about the good without some kind of irreducible positivity. You can try, and I'd be very interested in efforts to try, uh, and I'm certainly not saying that it, it is in the nature of things that you can, um, but it seems to me that in all my own investigations of uh, these discussions, uh, what you can do is you can move from one good to another good within an economy of transformation, exchange, and circulation. You can substitute higher goods for lower goods and vice versa. You can exchange one pile of goods for another pile of goods. You can exchange it and, add a, and have a very bad bargain. Uh, you can pay too much or too little. You can be gulled and you can uh, cheat somebody else. But it seems that it's very hard to get away from uh, good as, uh, and closely related to that, so I would say an irreducible positivity with various names. And uh, I don't myself want to now privilege any of these terms, but I will return later to the various domains in which the terms that I will now recite uh, operate as the name of the good. For example, gain, advantage, satisfaction, gratification, utility, profit, reward, pleasure, success. These are all. Uh, now the question is, but what is the good? Well, we're back with the same question as what is the value of that is. Maybe it just remains a list. Maybe it's just a list where sometimes we're talking about one part of the list and other times another part of the list. And that may be all that there is to say. Not that we're going to finally find out what the good is or what the basic quality of good is. Maybe we won't. I haven't been able to. Um, uh, but so I say irreducible positivity, but I add relative to some economy, that is, the good is perceived in relation to some apportionment and circulation of goods, so it doesn't, it is not perceived against nothing, and it is always as perceived by some observer, and I'm fairly neutral about what we want to say about the observer. You know, I don't want to say the subject, I don't want to give it any characteristics, and later on, as you'll see, uh, the observer is by no means a monolith. The observer is internally differentiated, uh, e internally uh, a highly contingent system in itself. In fact, the observer is also an, an economy, uh, so that you have uh, an interesting set of economies observing economies, values being evaluated in relation to um, interlocking, interdependent, mutually changing um, uh, systems of, um, of good. Uh, and finally, I just want to say a word about value. I can talk about the term and its history uh, at great length. Um, but let's just say it seems that in English and related European languages, I'm not sure of other languages, if there's a difference, it will be interesting. The, the, this um, uh, Conformity it doesn't hold any great uh, significance to me. It doesn't seem to point to anything, except that it has always maintained two meanings. And these meanings seem to move side by side throughout the history of recorded usages 
of the term value and cognate words such as wert and indeed the word worth and valois and so forth so, and valeur and so forth. So we seem to have the same sort of history where it means two things. One is equivalence in exchange or as we might say market value or price. And the other is something that we could call relative amount or comparative amount or comparative measure. So it is, uh, again, it could be, of course you can have negative value, but if it's not negative value, then value is positivity in comparison to, in relation to, what is seen as some scale, some uh, array, uh, so that seems. Now, it is also the case that this second and rather more elusive sense of value has often been attached to a notion of the intrinsic. Um, so that um, whereas the equivalence in exchange is seen as a de facto price that happens to be there and is understood as contingent, the other kind of value which is uh, the comparative worth, you know, what's a man worth, or is, you know, is, she, is she a good wife, uh, is, what is a human being, what is the value of a human being. The value of this painting, its true value, as opposed to what it will fetch in some market. All of those oppositions, which are very standard oppositions, uh, seem to presume upon some immeasurable, uh, non-comparative, ineffable, inherent, intrinsic, transcend transcendent, objective, absolute. All right, so this is the whole array of terms that get associated with this other sense of value, even though in many of its articulations, the relation, the contingent nature and the relation to a society of practices and observers is granted. For example, uh, the value of the poem you can read in some standard de definition of literary value is the esteem in which it is held. The esteem in which it is held, see, even though it effaces the agent through the passive voice, nevertheless is presuming that somebody's doing the esteeming. Um, but then, of course, the standard explanation will be is it is held in that esteem because of its intrinsic value. So then there will be uh, a reintroduction of the notion of the intrinsic. The intrinsic meaning here, the autonomous, the independent of circumstances, the non-conditional, that which is carried within the properties of the object itself as seen from nowhere by nobody in comparison with nothing. Okay, so again, it would be that, that notion of value which is going to be um, questioned uh, here. So those are some uh, terms, and uh, so I'll just continue by saying something about um, the scope of the question and uh, some, uh, some of, uh, idea of my approach to it, um, which I will be trying to um, uh, make clear. And uh, I mean, it's always in process. Um, so it's all right, that's one book, that's, that was Relativism 1, up to Relativism 2, for all I know, it's going to have an altogether different shape when it's Relativism 3, and even if I don't live so long, there's all of you, you're going to be going different places, you will have passed, whatever else happens to you, you will have passed through this class if you stay, all right? So something more is going to happen, which means that all of these are all of these formulations are, if not really up for grabs, I'm going to hold on to some of them, I've worked hard for them, nevertheless, they're there to be discussed, to be questioned, to be sharpened, or indeed loosened, uh, if that's the direction that they have to go in. Uh, in any case, uh, we are all, and the word we is always going to be subject to some scrutiny. Uh, I mean, even as I look around this room and I hardly know you uh, yet, I can already see a forms of diversity which are going to become very, very uh, sort of comically apparent as we encounter uses, invocations of this we, what we all know, what we feel when we read a poem, what we have always understood about, let me say, say wait a second, I mean, maybe you but not me, or maybe you and me but not him, or maybe you, me, and him, but not her. I mean, so this is going, the, which is not to say that we is impossible, but it does mean that we is always 
a population which could be specified because it can't be taken for granted, except when it is taken for granted. When nobody raises the question, we can go trotting along saying we without giving each other any grief over it. But it's always possible to say, I mean, who? You mean you and who else? Like me? Maybe not me. Maybe not even you. Uh, sometimes that, that we. Anyway, we uh, are... Uh, seem to be the heirs of a conceptual tradition, the one that I've just been talking about, um, that privileges a certain type of value, privileges it under the such terms as true, real, fundamental, and so forth, that being the term of privileging in this case, that privileges a certain type of value, that is posited, that type of value that is privileged is also posited as fixed, autonomous, and inherent in the properties of objects themselves, and as unaffected by situation and immune to the desires, needs, interests, or perspectives of folks, as unresponsive to particulars of time, place, culture, or history, and as ultimately, as ultimately ineffable and incalculable and as operating outside and beyond economy. All right, so that seems to be the, uh, as I say, the sense of value that is at least one of the senses that can be seen to operate since the first recorded um, usages. Classic and contemporary critical theory and all discourses of value in other humanistic disciplines, including aesthetics, ethics, epistemology, philosophy of science, and political theory, all of which we will be looking at in some ways uh, this term, all, uh, all of them are dominated by this conception. All of the humanistic disciplines are dominated by this conception of value, which indeed, I suggest, uh, is what marks them as humanistic disciplines. That is, it's precisely that conception of value and the conceptual syntax that goes along with it, which is the definitive mark of the, of the humanistic disciplines. Uh, and that conception is also central to the project of axiology in the sense that I defined it before, that is the effort to ground the privileged status of particular normative claims or practices on nature, logic, fact, history, reality, or some other foundation that is itself seen as objective, timeless, unconditional, necessarily determinate, universal, and universally binding. These being, as a matter of fact, part of the objectives. You might say that a good deal of classic philosophy and contemporary philosophy, insofar as it is still classic philosophy, is uh, keeping the world safe from relativism, if relativism is simply seen the questioning of precisely <coughs> that array of um, conceptions. Um, the axiological project <coughs> is classic and chronic, and so also are the charges of self-refutation and related specters, moral and political paralysis, collapse of standards, the corruption of taste, the decline of culture, chaos, nihilism, barbarism, and so forth, that are always evoked by the questioning of its defining goals and characteristic moves and fundamental assumptions. Okay, so what I'm saying is that axiology is classic, it's chronic, which means that it's, it's been there a long time, it continues to be there, and also classic and chronic, certainly the, uh, the, the self-refutation uh, is as old as Plato and Protagoras, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, repeated. I got a letter from Lynn, Ch <coughs> Lynn Cheney, is the, um, the head of the National Endowment for the Humanities uh, in the States. And uh, we've had many exchanges, uh, and to the point where we're actually friends. I said, oh, well, Lynn, yes, yeah, what, what is it now? So, well, Barbara, I mean, I've been reading that you were relatives. What I don't understand is how you can assert relativism, because if you assert relativism, then you are refuting yourself. I said, oh, okay, fine, thanks very much for letting me know that, Lynn. All right. <coughs> so it, it, it's absolutely automatic. You say one thing, it's, you push the button, someone's going to give you the self-refutation argument. The self-refutation argument sometimes is right, but it's not always right. That is, it is not always a revelation of the impossibility of certain kinds of formulations which are not classical formulations. And I will try to produce some here and also tell you how to handle your friends who will give you self-refutationism, you know, <laughs> it, 
pretty soon. Okay. Uh, what I will show is that such charges and specters are irrelevant to and unwarranted by uh, the questions and alternative formulations developed in this course. Nevertheless, there's no question but that this course is a critique of axiology, both as a recurrent set of deeply problematic and highly consequential institutional and social claims that is not, and also as a currently and long time preemptive theoretical project. When I say it's a preemptive theoretical project, what I mean is that the, the uh, development of axiology in the uh, sense of the attempt to ground correct judgment preempts other ways of understanding the operation of the normative, the operation of standards, uh, the nature of evaluative language, uh, the relation among various forms of uh, value in many domains. So there are a lot of other things that could be studied, and I hope you would study them, and I see them myself more and more being studied in a, let's call it post-axiological uh, examination of value in, in the domains that I've talked about, such as philosophy of science, epistemology, um, ethics, uh, aesthetics, which barely exists now uh, as a field under that name, but certainly in cultural studies, and we'll be looking at uh, some works in, in those fields. So there are many, many things to be said, you might say, in the arena, on the site that has been occupied by axiology. So at the least you say, you know, give us some room. There are some other things that could be done instead of going around this particular circle another set of times. Uh, but uh, the seminar and the readings that we'll be doing uh, in um, Bourdieu and Laclau and Mouffe. Uh, by the way, uh, Chantal Mouffe is going to be giving a talk at what time? Does anyone, does anyone hear the time? Uh, on Monday in political science, um, uh, sponsored by political science, it would be a good idea to listen to her because we're going to be reading uh, Hegemony and Socialist Strategy later in the term and get an idea, which is going to be talking about citizenship. Uh, the book, Hegemony and Socialist Strategy, is by Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe. Uh, it is a good, it's a very provocative example of a post-Marxist uh, political theory and distinctively post-axiological in that it begins to operate with that set of what seem to be the moves that are replacing the object of the absolute, the foundational, the established, the authentic, seems to be terms like contingent, practice, network, local. Uh, these, so we seem to be getting an alternative cluster um, of um, terms and perhaps, uh, in effect, alternative models that are convergent in some ways themselves uh, for social and cultural theory. So what I want to say is that in addition to being a critique of the axiological tradition, I see the course as also an introduction to various forms of post-axiological structure, which are not merely post-axiological and sort of like clear this away and now we'll put this, but the very process of the clearing away has turned out to be a productive process. It was not just a swipe of the hand, it was not just let's get rid, but it was not so easy to get rid. as. And indeed, one never comes on the scene, I don't think, saying, let us get rid. What happens is one comes on the scene already saying, it's not working, it hurts my head, it's not comfortable, but what about this? And in the very process of articulating that state of discomfort, of uh, not, and it doesn't work in a number of ways, and at least two, which we can always remember, is it doesn't work theoretically, it <coughs> makes your head feel bad. And it doesn't work practically, that is institutionally, socially, politically, to do the things that you want to do, some of you, some of us. Uh, uh, nothing that I say can move us, however, toward a convergence on finally the next and perhaps ultimately proper way. Because to the extent, and this is going to be a song that I will sing repeatedly, especially in connection with political theory, and indeed here I would have some quarrels with Laclau and Mouffe, um, who I think for all the attention to the, lo the local and the differential, still are, for understandable reasons, afraid of relativism and too much pluralism, nevertheless want to see an ultimate convergence, whereas I don't. I neither want to see it, nor do I see it. So I think that there will have to be differences among us insofar as the problems with axiologic logic, what I call axiologic logic, are problems in their social and political application, and we have different goals, all of us. 
because we're different and some of those goals may be not merely quite diverse but in considerable conflict with one another. And those conflicts, I would suggest, are not going to be resolved by our understanding or reformulation of axiology. Indeed, one of the points that I would make is that that's never the place where they are resolved anyway, and never the, that the axiological argument, you might say, is one of the moves that is made in a political, social, institutional, rhetorical playing out of difference as if that was where the, um, uh, the points were to be won. Some points are won there, but never decisively, um, because the energy is always going to come from the actual position of the agents in a world of circumstance with things to lose and gain. And the argument is not going to be the only thing to be lost or won. And indeed, the losing and the winning of the argument very often depends in reverse on who it is who's winning in other ways, for example, institutionally. I think what one of the things that I will be suggesting when we read Hume and Kant on this question is um, I think one can see the circularity of the arguments, the key arguments, that is the key axiological arguments, certainly not everything that's said, but the key axiological moves in the standard of taste, which I'll ask you to read for next time, and in the critique of judgment, particularly the analytic of the beautiful of Kant, that we can now see without too much difficulty that there are key moves that beg the question, and in effect, un cancel out the major claims. The question then becomes, how is it that they were so persuasive? That is, have we suddenly um, sharpened uh, cortexes so that we can see a logic uh, where, you know, for 200, 250 years, two of the finest minds, you know, have produced, uh, you know, on the face of the earth were both produced this illogical logic and were applauded for having produced it. Why is it that we, that it now seems absolutely, almost transparently, but wait a second, what have you done here? I mean, you can't do that, or you forgot this, or you made this leap. I mean, this is just, you can't do this. So what has made the difference? As I say, it's not that the heads have gotten um, sharper, it's that the use that has been made of those arguments is no longer the, the use that we want to make. In other words, we want to make a different argument. Or again, I have to say, some of us, you see, this we will have to go back and forth because for many of these um, issues, I am myself, at least by his, my own history, aware of more divergence uh, than on other of them. Anyway, um, so what I am saying is that the course and seminar readings are not just um, in order to produce a critique but to attempt to develop more intellectually responsive and otherwise productive formulations, at least as we measure it, um, socially, institutionally, political formulations of the various concepts uh, at issue. Value, taste, standards, justification, reality, truth, art, and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> The system of concepts that um, I'll be presenting here as an alternative to classic value theory uh, is developed in the first instance uh, in the book Contingencies of Value through detailed reconceptualizations of the notions of value and evaluation themselves. Uh, I indicate this briefly in the first chapter, which was um, sort of a throwaway, which I wrote a long time ago. Someone said, uh, you know, you're a Shakespearean. We're having this session on Shakespeare's sonnets. You've written on Shakespeare's sonnets. It's about evaluating Shakespeare's sonnets, and I was already thinking about writing about evaluation. And I said, oh, well, okay, this topic has my name on it. So I did that in about um, 20 minutes, okay, the initial presentation, which was 20 minutes to deliver. I probably sat down and wrote it in 20 minutes and spend 10 years after that figuring out what I had said. I mean, did I really want to say it? Did I really want to go so far? And if I put it that way, well, what would it mean for this? So that's what happened. It was like it was all wound up at a certain point, and I didn't know what it was. But it's, you know, it made tremendously good sense, and it's a fact that I, I had been playing it out for a long time after, after that. Anyway, I briefly indicated in the first chapter, and uh, explored later in the book in relation to a variety of value-centered issues in other domains, as I said, ethics, epistemology, political theory, and philosophy of language, as well as literary uh, criticism and ethics and aesthetics. 
Uh, the initial and most crucial of the alternative perspectives that I want to propose is a pointedly non-dualistic, and in the sense that I gave you before, nominalistic account of the idea of value. The uh, sheet that I've handed out contains uh, at least some of the most uh, of the most uh, of the familiar oppositions. I'll just have you glance at the shape of the sheet. I'll, uh, when we come back after the break, I'll ask you to look at it more and raise questions about it. But the shape of it is: we must. It is said, in effect, top. It is said that we must distinguish between the truly, genuinely whatever it is, or true, genuine art, and so forth, and mere entertainment. Real aesthetic value as opposed to mere market value. That which is genuinely universal as opposed to that which is merely local and particular. A true work of art as opposed to a mere utilitarian object. I'm just going around the list here. Uh, a genuine artist as opposed to a mere worker or producer. Uh, what a, a real museum, not just a market, okay? And I end by saying, must we, can we? I mean, if it is said, we must distinguish between, and if maintaining that distinction is, you might say, both the heart of the humanistic enterprise, which I will associate later on with the temple as opposed to the market, okay? And uh, associate the market with the place where value is mixed, mingled, transformed, and exchanged as opposed to the temple, which consists of both keeping the market, if it can, out of the temple, and also maintaining the absolute borders, uh, the absolute boundaries around all forms of value, especially the intrinsic from the marketable. Okay, then the question is, must we and can we? Must we in the sense of what will happen if we don't? That is, what hangs on it, this distinction? And can we in the sense of Theoretically, as we try very, very hard to maintain these distinctions, are we able to do so? Are they not folding into one another and creating intermediate and muddy areas? And perhaps that which we've called muddy areas is not merely mud. Maybe that's where we live. Maybe that's where it's all right to live, to move around a little bit. Uh, I would suggest that uh, one of the things that happens almost immediately when you raise questions about those distinctions, which are at the heart of the heart of things, I mean, you can't, I mean, this, this is Christianity, this is Marxism, and this is what I call uh, redemptive humanism. Uh, so this is, it's hardly as if this is just some minor set of thoughts uh, that people have. It's definitely the heart of the heart of the matter. One of the things that happens almost as surely as the self-refutation argument will be, but I want, I say, I want to quest, question the difference between art and entertainment. So you want to reduce all art to entertainment. Okay. I want to question the difference, all right, uh, between statements of fact and judgment. So you're saying that all statements of facts are just matters of opinion. You understand, when you question the traditional opposition, and the privileged term, you are seen as reducing everything to one, namely the demoted term. Now, it's just an amazingly automatic move, and I see it happening over and over. I said, no, no, I didn't say that. All I said is I want to question this distinction. I want to question how, it's, how it operates, whether we need it, whether there might be some other way of arranging these terms. But it's as if um, there is an, an automatism that seems to be built into the nature of the distinction, which is that everything hangs on it, and that the only alternative to maintaining the distinction is to have everything the demoted term. Uh, uh, well, since it is indeed uh, three minutes after two, and I usually like to take a break, uh, give your ears and my throat a break, so in, not more than seven minutes, and then we'll come back and continue more about what I'm up to and what questions you might have. <laughs>